you are a group of blockchain veterans passionate about simplifying your journey in crypto. We understand the complexities that come when diving into the world of blockchain. But no worries, Komodo is here to assist you. Visit komodoplatform.com slash guide and grab our free Getting Started with Crypto resource. With us, you will learn how to manage your crypto assets without depending on third parties. Prioritize security and ensure you never lose your crypto. This episode and the resources on commonplatform.com slash guide will provide the answers you seek. Now, let's dive into today's episode. We are going to dive into how to stay secure exploring common reasons for hacks, the best security practices to follow, and why it's crucial to maintain control over your keys. We will also delve into the original ethos and philosophy behind Bitcoin. And uh, today, in this very first episode of Voices of Komodo, we have a veteran team of Komodo team members here to, to guide us all into, into crypto. So first up, we have um, Kadan CA33 Stadelman, the CTO of Komodo. Welcome. Hello, everyone. And next, we have uh, Charles P2IX Gonzalez, a business developer for Komodo. Hi, everyone. Glad to be here. And finally, Jason Polycryptoblock Brown, who's also a business developer for Komodo. Hello, everyone. This is going to be a great episode. I'm happy, really looking forward to this and making this, this podcast. And, and what I really want to um, talk about are the early days and what the newcomers especially should be aware of who, who just entered into crypto or perhaps has entered in the recent years. And I think who better to have this conversation than, than you guys. So first off, I would like to go in back in time to the early days, whatever you remember. So perhaps you have um, some memory or a story you want to tell to kind of give, give some insight to the newer people. Like what, what was it like in the, in the early days when Bitcoin was coming out and, and it was a totally new thing. And so who would like to share? Do you, do you have some, something, something you would like to, to have some story? For, for sure. I mean, I, I'll just like take a bit of it. I'll leave the rest of it. I guess like everyone has something like to share in this regard. To me, just from a core perception, I'd say very abstract, right? It's like very different. Like things change like a lot from like many perspectives. Um, I guess like at the very beginning, like, you know, of the, the or when the crypto community started just forming, right? It was initially mostly like BTC centric, then miner centric. I guess that was one of the biggest like community layers was actually like the mining community. And... I mean, the ethos, you know, was different, kind of like the motivation for everyone, like to be part of it was different. We had a lot of like, you know, like geeks, nerds, you know, like tacky people like us. I'd say like a big portion of the community was also like part of the gamer community. Like definitely that's at least like my experience and, and how I see it, like based on the, the people I know. And I think what changed a lot like over time is, and that's one thing like a lot of like people already refer to as like this, you know, Deegan thing. And uh, that, I, I guess that's that's one of the core, you know, like changes is that there's a lot more people that's core interest is money, right? Like less about, you know, ideology, vision and all these things that I guess initially like got a lot of us like into this, right? Like that's at least like how I yeah perceive it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I also feel like there was a kind of different mentality in the early days. It was was about technology and, and what can the technology achieve? What is the f- future world going to look like? Uh, so Charles or Jason, would you, would you agree on, on what's your take on, on the early days? Yeah, I think um, things have changed. Things change quickly uh, in, the, in the tech space and it changes quicker in, in blockchain just because the technology just keeps like evolving. And you can't really compare um, at least when I entered crypto, which was in early 2016, to now, um, what the communities are like and what the main focus is like. So I, I definitely agree with that. And I think uh, a cool memory f- for me, anyways, was seeing how the community 
basically helped each other out in the early days. It was very community focused. So any question, any problem that you had, it was all managed through Slack. And it was really cool seeing how like these groups of people would organize themselves without anybody tell them, you know, what to do and help each other out. And, and that was really, really cool for me. That was, I think, one of the things that kind of like brought me into into this world. And, and uh, yeah, I think now it's a little bit different. It's more, you know, some of the projects have lost that essence. Um, but but yeah, again, it's a world that it keeps evolving. So who knows what it's going to look like in five years, 10 years. What about what are you thoughts, Jason? Um, yeah, uh, so I, I've been around since uh, like 2012 um, in the crypto space. And yeah, I agree. A lot of stuff has changed. I mean, back in the day, there really wasn't any, uh, well, there, there wasn't any centralized place to, to get Bitcoin. You had to um, either use local Bitcoin um, or you had to you know, get it from eBay, which then you got you know, really screwed on the price and could get, uh, you know, uh, you know, scammed or uh, you had to use Weirbox. Uh, which uh, was a exchange for uh, Linden dollars for the game Second Life, and then you could exchange Linden dollars for Bitcoin. Uh, that's how you know I got a lot into it. Um, so it's become a lot easier for people to onboard. Uh, but I'll agree with everyone else here. Like the mentality has changed. Um, you know, I, I feel like a lot of people kind of miss the point of crypto nowadays. Um, you know, they, they viewed as a way to, to make money instead of uh, as money itself. Um, and, you know, I, th I think we'll actually end up going back to that, uh, the original uh, ethos at some point. Um, but uh, at the current time, uh, you know, people, you know, most of the world just being introduced to it the first time. And uh, so, you know, they're comparing what we do in crypto to, um, you know, how other instruments in the world work, like stocks and such. Um, and it's going to take some time for them to, you know, see that, you know, what uh, Bitcoin and uh, crypto in general is doing is a lot, uh, a lot larger in scope than what, uh, you know, a simple uh, wealth or trading instrument. Um, it's, you know, the original ethos was to, to give the, the power of, you know, holding your wealth and to transfer freely, uh, you know, to the people. And uh, I, I think that's going to be very important here in the, in the future. So um, even though most people now are in it for the gains, um, you know, I, I think they'll, they'll view it as a, a tool in the, in the future, uh, like how us uh, old timers do. I went back some weeks ago and about some old presentation about Bitcoin from, from many years ago. And one of the common themes in these videos and presentations were that um, it was very much stressed, the self-custody that you need to keep the Bitcoins and, and the ethos of Bitcoins is that they are, they are money for you that you control. And that kind of goes to what Jason, you were just saying that, uh, that it's, it's a tool to kind of hold the power of, of wealth and kind of be your own bank as we have heard since the beginning that Bitcoin is, you are able to be your own bank. And those were really the, the values of the early days. But then today, most people don't have control over their assets and coins and crypto. Why do you think that is? Or like, how, where did we get lost? Well, I, I think, you know, I personally think like it's, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but I'd say it's like in alignment with the agenda, right? Like kind of, I, I guess like the industry has this like core interest in like, having gaining having slash gaining control over crypto just like in general and i guess a very convenient way you know for the for, for the system like for you know like uh, financial institutions etc to do this and to achieve it is through like indirect control like through kind of like you know masked layers and entities say centralized exchanges etc cetera, etc cetera. like it's so easy to get a hold of these coins you know maybe hex uh, it could be warrant it's, you know it could be like court letters like there's basically for the establishment like a way of you know making sure people don't actually own coins right like the second i mean uh, a, a positive effect like for these institutions and and i i'd say like in most cases that's also part of the terms of the services they're allowed to basically do with the coins whatever they want most services at least 
while the coins are in, under their possession. Um, again, it's it's a narrative. It's you know like it's it's something that's being you know like uh, you know like um, I don't want to say it's like set up on purpose, but it's definitely like the industry's interest to achieve this. I mean, look at like uh, ETH, right? Like this uh, standard that basically this account abstraction that that technically allows. You know that a technically implemented trust. Let's put it like that to not like you know uh, uh, shift off. But th basically, that's implemented trust, right? Like into the blockchain stack by allowing like uh, certain third parties to give them the ability to restore your keys, right? Like so. I mean, that alone. Thinking about it, if you like join this ecosystem in the early days with and and you know the the core ethos, the core ideology of it, you'd understand that that stands in absolute paradox to the tech's actual design and core purpose. So again, it's literally taking what we already have, this totally centralized corrupted financial stack and kind of like transferring it into a decentralized network. I mean, I take, I give them that point, but as for the rest, as for who controls and owns the actual assets, I mean, that, that, that's where we have like a huge problem, right? It to me does sound a lot like they want users to, you know, move towards, you know, like, um, you know, the, you know, central, you know, based digital tokens, you know, like from 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 banks, right? Like CDBCs, etc. How they baptized this, right? Like, and I, I guess that's like one of the, you know, like the main objectives here as to why, you know, like there's more and more trust been implemented in the blockchain industry. You know, there's more and more tools. I mean, tools, you know, to me, it's not a tool. To me, it's a threat, like more and more like actual threats. But yeah, please, like, I'm, I'm sure the others have like some some inputs as well. That's kind of like my, my core idea on this. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. We are coming, like we always in the industry always talk about decentralization and decentralization. And a lot of the tech is decentralized in a way, but, but still in this weird way, there's a lot of centralization in terms of people not holding their keys, not holding their assets, and it's transitioning into this, integrating into this um, normal financial world in a way that is kind of like going against the original ethos and, and what Bitcoin was supposed to be about. So, so that, is, that is interesting. And so certainly like this, you mentioned the CBDCs, the central bank, bank digital currencies, like, like they are coming and, and there's certainly a big push to get them here for everyday use, but then those are not crypto in, in the sense of the original crypto where you would have control over the, the money, but, but that is someone else can dictate how that those central bank digital currencies are used and they can change the rules on a whim so they have even more control as a result than they have today in the traditional financial system. And it's all because of some of the innovation that blockchain has brought up, brought about, but but they are removing some aspects that, from our perspective, are superior, and and then just rebuilding what was already there, but it's just more powerful and more invasive in terms of privacy. Yeah, I think um, I think it's a mix of things. Um, I think in part the majority of people, especially not like hardcore people that that are into tech are somewhat lazy. Um, and you can basically, it, it's kind of like asking somebody to custody their their own bank account, right? Like most people aren't gonna know what to do. They're not gonna, they're not gonna wanna do it. They rather just give the responsibility to somebody else. And it's kind of like a false sense of, uh, of security because, you know, at the end of the day, if your bank account gets hacked, Sure, you you might be insured for a certain amount, but you most likely aren't going to get all of it back if it's a large amount. Uh, so it's the same with crypto, uh, same with email, same with passwords. You know, most people rather hand off the password to a password manager because it's easier. So it's convenience at the end of the day. That and obviously for like I think what Kadan said makes a lot of sense as well for governments for banks. It makes more sense. For them to custody or have access somewhat to your funds um, but i think anyone that knows how bitcoin works and knows the real benefit of holding bitcoin will most likely self-custody at, at least they're gonna have to learn how to do it yeah um you know uh, to add on to this point um that uh 
Yeah, it, it, the biggest one of the biggest hurdles to, to overcome, uh, you guys really have pointed out, is that you know people are you know they don't want the responsibility for you know their their own funds and money, um, but at the same time they they want to to have the freedom and control. And unfortunately, in this world, like you know, those are on two op- opposite sides of the the spectrum. If you know you're not gonna take responsibility for your own funds and you know you're you're at the will of the custodian which is typically some bank or some you know government um which can uh, be uh you know very bad depending on uh, you know where you live um or your own personal situation um uh, say you're a, a dissident in a, a country that's uh politically unstable uh you know, it's you can't really keep your money in a bank there because bank, you know, your bank accounts will get frozen. Um, so it's, I, I agree with everybody uh, here saying that, you know, um, you know, custody is, you know, extremely important. Um, you know, I definitely would like to see more of that. Uh, you know, with people, uh, you know, as well, and I uh, also like to highlight the point, like with CBDCs, because we often see hear them mentioned uh, alongside crypto. Um, but from the ones that I've looked at so far, like none of them actually like use a blockchain. They're they're literally just a, a centralized uh, interface. Um, you know, typically to some government or one of their you know subsidiaries that they uh, set up. Uh, one uh, I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, it was called Jamdex, which is in uh, Jamaica. It's being used for uh, essentially their their taxi service system, um, where people are being encouraged to use the CBDC, um, you know, to to handle uh, that subset of transactions. Um, it's still, you know, in its early stages, but it's um, you know, it, it don't let don't be fooled. It's it's not crypto. Um, just because it's digital doesn't mean it's you know it's it's the same thing. So um, yeah, I just want to highlight that that point out too. That um, w- when we hear CBDCs, um, you know, you 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 will never have custody of the CBDC. Like that's always going to be controlled by the bank. So don't be fooled into thinking that oh, if you have a CBDC, that you're self custody the uh, your funds um it's uh, it's a very different uh mechanism to you know compared to bitcoin for instance yeah the central bank digital currencies on i have heard them described as programmable money but no like you are not going to program them i'm not going to program them but the central bankers or whoever, whoever institutions behind them they are going to set some rules and the sky's the limit on the rules they can set. So, for example, they could hand over to me money and then have certain conditions in place for where and how I can spend them. They could even set the expiry date to say that I only have like one year to spend this money. And if, if I don't spend it, then it's just poof, gone. Like, those are just a few examples that they could do among with negative interest rates. So, it's, it's, it's like really like this utopian system that, that is being provided as an alternative. So I think that there's going to be this, this battle for, um, for what kind of a monetary system we are going to have in the, going in the future as this technology is just going to keep improving. And, and um, on the other side, we have Bitcoin and more traditional cryptocurrencies. But it's, in the theme of this episode has been like the, the non-custodial aspect. So how do we maintain control over the, the money and make that easy? Because that, to me at least, is the key to this whole thing. And ever since the beginning of Bitcoin, I would say that that, um, that we have been failing on that aspect. And I'm going to tell a story about my own situation as I was getting started with Bitcoin and, and uh, neither did I withdraw the money to my wallet, unfortunately. So so I entered, I heard about Bitcoin and, and I entered the famous MT Cox exchange back in the day. It was the only exchange operational as far as I knew. And um, I just knew that I want to get to Bitcoin because it's a future gold, basically. And I just bought some and uh, it went up some. And then I, when I tried to sell it, it, it was crashing. The whole markets were coming down and MT Cox just 
froze and I, I was unable to sell. And I just watched the whole market just plummet and I, I lost my money, basically. So, so that was my experience in crypto. And, and I think many people have the same experience, no matter which year they enter. And then what happened to me also, like I didn't want to hear that crypto for many years. I was, I'm, I'm done with this thing. <laughs> like, but, but, uh, but there was even that early days, like there was no, like I wasn't aware of wallets. It was just later when I really started to look into it that I started to understand that I should like how to take control over the, over the Bitcoins. So it's not so trivial task. And I guess because of that, no one is still doing it. Like even I have, I have some friends who are, who are crypto and they just keep it in like chains. So, so the question is like, how can we, what needs to happen that we can make this easier for normal people to hold custody over their, their crypto? Yeah, I remember um, I never had a, I never lost funds in an exchange, thankfully, but I did lose plenty of wallet that the file, like the backups. Uh, <laughs> I remember one day I was, I was buying this coin and I mean, for me, it was, it was a lot of money and I backed, I, I sink the wallet. It took three days to sink it. And when I sink the wallet, I backed up the wallet, that file. Um, and then when I went to log back in, <laughs> it wasn't there. It didn't work. And man, like I lost it. I lost it. And I had I, I tried to restore like deleted files. I tried to do all this this black magic on my computer, and yeah, it was gone. <laughs> well, this kind of sounds very scary for a newcomer, like and confusing. This this like how to take backup. So how would you explain like how easy it is to to make backups and how to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think now it's a hundred times easier, right, Kadan, than it was back in the day. Yeah, back in the day, I, I, <laughs> you, had, you had to back up a file. It was a file every time you made a transaction. If not, <laughs> it was a file, you know, with a limited address pool, right? So, so sometimes even uh, like bad timing can mess things up. And I remember if you had to do a lot, done a lot with them, and you were a miner. Like, that's the issue you get like you use terminal you know command line you feel like biggest hacker you know like you hit that you know like dot coin demon name slash you know wallet dot you know that file and if you just like do rm minus rf within like that folder because that's the fastest way to get rid of like the block data and everything and you just like start over and i guess like anyone like you know who's been like mining bitcoin like back in the day has had this issue at least like once, right? Like no matter how OG and how pro you are. And I admit, you know, it happened to me as well. I've deleted, you know, all of that, you know, files myself, basically wrecked myself. But to get back like to your question, I believe, you know, it really, I mean, first of all, I think there's like a thousand ways on how we could, you know, um, offer reliable, easy, secure, like backup possibilities. Example, don't let the user even like use the wallet application unless there is some way of validation verification that he's executed the backup process regardless of how that might look like right second point here education 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 right like i guess that's the second and last point even like you know from my side is like you know when someone understands what this is right like even just from a key perspective you don't have to get all that blockchain stuff and the tech and how the network works and all that complex things and you don't even ha have to know what does it mean like you know to be trustless and permissionless and all that but i guess like you'll get closer to the answer of all these things if you get to know what your fucking wallet address and sorry for my wording right like the key pair is what the private key in this case the seed phrase is right like if we explain this to a user like really well, maybe even like highlight the risks, you know, associated to losing this, giving it out to a bad party, having a non-secure environment where you store this. This could be a computer, a piece of paper, no matter what, right? If it's a piece of paper, I stick it on my back. It's just as safe as a super infiltrated computer where I store it in a text file called seed.txt. You know what I mean? Like, so these kind of like the stuff where I believe, like, of course, for us, it's common sense. But the user, I think, needs to be educated towards, hey, like, if you mess up with this, you're done. So best thing to do is get yourself a hardware wallet. 
that's like where 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 it's almost guaranteed nothing bad will happen unless again you fuck up with the seed or backups or or that kind of things on that device so at the end of the day it boils down like to you know like this uh, cap cap uh, you know like uh, uh, error like you know where they say like the problem exists between key and and a keyboard and chair right like and not like in the software or in the tech but it's about us the industry to make sure that this education because this is a very abstract word that that is done right because i believe right now it's not right like it's it's actually like done super wrong i believe like what what we're educating new users or what they you know are educating new you know on making things easier um you know you know one of the improvements that have come through the years is you know with our uh the use of light wallets so there isn't that uh key management issue that uh you guys were talking about or at least not as much for the average user um so i, I think that's been a big improvement uh some of the other things that have been um you know uh, be, that are being pursued to make things easier uh for people more friendly uh, would be like human readable addresses um also key generation that is um you know the kind of abstracts out the the whole seed portion in an easier way i think a lot of uh, users get um intimidated by that you know that they have to have this really long phrase and keep it you know uh backed up and secured and stuff and uh you know i think that makes a lot of people uh uncomfortable so if they uh, you know having ways uh to generate that key that are you know uh a bit easier whether that's through sort of like some you know hardware device or you know uh possibly like a split key system uh where a you know a third party holds a slice of the key um so you can regenerate the key on your own or if you have all the details or if you didn't you could be able to use your portion of the key and that uh, third party that's holding the slice to regenerate your data um, but it, it's, uh, it's, you know, making it user friendly is a, uh, constant, uh, uphill battle because, uh, you know, users will always find, you know, some, some way to, to use the product in, in an unintentional manner. <laughs> and I mean, you can make it user friendly, right? But it, it's like you said, it's, it's, it's almost like security or user friendly. It, there has to be like a good middle ground but we haven't really found it yet i mean not like yeah. and i think the last point jason said is a good one is you know like usually if you give him like some really like no matter how good the functionality is they'll find a way to fuck up there's one thing you know and this is like not just an anecdote this is like actual this is real story like you guys can like hit you know like um uh, OGs like from the early bitrex days up and ask them or even like bitrex reach your rami and they uh, like validate this right so they implemented the feature which basically was nuke wallet or delete wallet or wipe wallet or something like that. Oh, wow. button, like in the settings, like in your user profile. And you could like kill your 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 fonts. Like it will it will basically just, you know, like do it. And like no joke within their ISC, and I'm sure there's some locks of that, like to actually read this up. The, the, it was asked, hey, was well, this is this feature actually been used or something? And they say you will not believe how many users are using you know like that feature to to like wipe out funds and afterwards like you know get like to us you know complain and something and that's like a very important thing also like to add about like our industry our like communities because they have like something very unique to it right like you know it's the the stegen factor right like and and yeah truth i think there's something very com comforting in the idea of a centralized exchange because it's it's like a normal bank so people are used to that they want to log in with the email and then make some password. And if they forget the password, you can always restore it to your email. So it feels safe and comfortable, right? And, and I think that that is really the fear of the wallets because people don't really understand it. And so they, they fear to use it. So perhaps we could spend a few moments to clarify the myths of wallets and what they really are. And, and you, you can expand on this, but, uh, but to me, like people maybe often think that wallets hold their coins, but but actually the coins are in the blockchain. There's a, there's recorded in the blockchain, so you could ac access the coins from any wallet. So what you need to need is the seed that that you that you've been mentioning here. So the seed seed phrase of twelve or twenty four words, 
that is the that is the thing that needs to be backed up and then that is what the keys are generated from right and those keys are kept in the wallet so the wallet manages keys to access the blockchain to make a transaction is, is that a good way to explain it if I may add something, I guess one good, very simple way of also explaining it is like, you know, like the blockchain world, at least like for most blockchain, non-privacy focused ones, right? Is that it's actually like a public banking system where you're able to access everyone's bank account. You're able to look into everyone's expenses, incomes, current balance, et cetera, et cetera, full balance sheet for every company out there, et cetera, and so on. But you're not able to use the withdraw or send functionality unless you have the quote unquote password to that bank account, right? But that's what, you know, like they all are, what Bitcoin actually is. It's like a public, you know, open, you know, like banking and financial system, like from that perspective. And again, like you need like this, you know, like quote unquote password, you know, to be able to use the send function. But other than that, you're actually like able, you know, to see everything, to read everything out there. That's a good way to explain it. Looking at it. Yeah, first time I heard that, I, I really like that explanation. It makes it very clear. Makes sense. All right, so I'll be changing the topic a little bit to talk about um, hacks to kind of drive home the point of why we should have the coins under our control because in the long term, it's going to be so much more secure when we take the responsibility to learn how to, how to keep our coins ourselves in our wallet and, and back up the seed phrase. And... Basically, on a monthly basis, we hear from another hack, and, and most of the time these hacks happen for a custodial, so some sort of service that might even advertise themselves being decentralized, but, but still the funds are in some way or another centralized, and then somehow the private keys get compromised, and a hacker steals like millions of dollars. And I was looking at the biggest hacks of this year, and, and they, they were, just to mention a few, there's one called Euler Finance, which was a lending platform in March 2023. The hacker stole 200 million. Then there was a multi chain blockchain breach in July, and, and there was 125 million. And then there was a normal exchange called CoinEx, and their hacker stole 70 million. And we don't even necessarily know if there have been other hacks, because as an as a exchange, you don't necessarily want to want that become public knowledge so it's it's very kind of dangerous situation that these hacks just keep happening and and m- most of the time people are losing this money because they didn't have the control and if you hold the control then basically you need to get hacked personally and it doesn't make sense to target individuals but it does make a lot of sense to target like one giant pool of money sitting with 200 million in it like you you can spend so much resources because it's going to be worth it if, if you just manage to to get hold of those private keys so i guess this is especially for uca kind of a question like why does these hacks happen in these so-called decentralized finance um lending pools and otherwise like like what's what's going on like you would think that these are secure because they are so-called decentralized uh, services but still somehow people lose money so what's what's going on there yeah, I, I guess it's a misbelief, you know, to think that just because a software or in this case, some financial technology stack is decentralized or trustless, so that will make it like automatically, you know, like secure and safe, right? Like also like the fact that something's permissionless would actually like promote the opposite. Like, you know, that's already like a hint that, okay, anyone's able to access this network. There's no real, you know, um, you know, obfuscation layers like we have with the traditional financial system and other like of these stacks. I mean, I'm sure, 100% sure, that if you look at TradFi and, you know, the, the legacy banking financial stacks and systems, they are probably much more vulnerable like to issues and they probably, many of them have so, such core deep problems, but they're not known because stuff is just like, you know, like uh, proprietary software, everything is like non-disclosed, um, nothing's open sourced and so on, right? Like, so that's like one thing is, why you know there's like still hacks happening is that first of all again the tech hasn't had the chance to really mature right like um i I guess the industry is still you know like evolving on a sub-optimal streak when it comes like to cybersecurity. um second of all it's always you know uh, even if uh, that puts like that right like so there's certain core technology stacks like underlying technology that's being used 
that might be deemed secure, safe, according to the current, like, you know, like uh, assessments, right? And that often just means that we currently don't have the necessary, like, uh, resources to hack it or we currently, you know, all these things. So it's not, it's never a guarantee. There's never real safety. There is never, like, being 100% secure. And as for these, like, DeFi stacks that get hacked and infiltrated, uh, it's often the case that there's either, you know, a, 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 a central, um, points of failure implemented, say, keys that would have like control over the deployed smart contracts, over the liquidity pools, and so on, or actual issues, errors, bugs in the implementations, right? Like, so people code something, develop it, but it's like suboptimal. It's not like well made. It offers like a tech service, sometimes logic flaws, you know, like these basically the algorithms having like problems and so on right like, but again the list for the actual potential problems is like super super long right like there's like so many different possibilities to attack a, a, a blockchain stack right like a DeFi technology um and i i believe like the way to really reduce risks is if you keep the core ethos the core ideology of it its core intended purpose as kind of like the guider right like this is like kind of like the 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 base architecture that's how things should be right like the more we compromise this by adding like certain layers of control and like keys that can do certain things that others can't and so on that's always where like you know like problems will start where you'd actually like you know introduce like security threats like to a blockchain architecture um but i do expect that all these like problems will you know like be solved on an exponential level and in, in grade over the coming years and with you know like with ai technology evolving like so fast right um so yeah i i mean i would like to chime in here um I mean, we we hear about these uh you know large hacks and stuff but i, I actually am in disagreement i think the smaller hacks are the the more scary uh proposition uh, specifically because you know when an individual user gets hacked you know the, the application that they you know got you know hacked on um you know if it's just a, a small you know if it's not like a widely reported problem you know the the application builder will just you know essentially i don't want to say like push the blame but kind of to that user, right? Oh, they did something wrong. They weren't secure or something. Um, just because it's an isolated instance when, um, you know, the, the problem is a lot more pervasive. Um, you know, one that, and I, I think there's, and this isn't just with uh, crypto, but in, in general, uh, with how a lot of uh, authentication systems uh, today work um you know they, they're kind of using a tool that really wasn't meant for the that job and and because it's it's a lot more convenient and but it opens a massive attack vector um for people um so what i'm referring to uh for the audience is uh token stealing um you know if you log in to a website they typically give you a a token uh that's stored in uh you know, either as in local storage or, or as a cookie. And um, these can be, you know, um, taken somehow. And, um, you know, either through a uh, bad extension or through uh, some, you know, other tricks uh, that hackers can do. And once they get that token, um, you know, if you're, you know, currently logged in or, or such, they can essentially masquerade as you and um you know execute actions on your behalf because it you know the system thinks you you are them you know an authenticated authenticated user uh in in the system and this will bypass you know things like two-factor authentication which people think is good you know you know oh if they don't have my phone then you know i'm safe and that's not the case at all um you know in uh recently there was a major issue and it's still very prevalent out there now so uh for people listening uh, you know take heed um uh, recently uh a service known as oauth um basically 
uh, that's the if you ever log into a website and you see, oh, log in with Google, log in with Facebook, or log in with whatever you know third party service. Um, you know, it, a lot of uh, sites don't actually do uh, validation. So, um, what I mean by this is like if you logged into a compromised site with that OAuth, they could take that token information basically resend it to another service that you would, you know, or signed up for, and it would grant them that authentication, which obviously is a very horrible situation. And that could lead to, you know, a, a people losing their crypto or, you know, other uh, services account, uh, you know, login. So, you know, it, it, it leads to account takeover uh, for the attacker and you losing your stuff. Um, so it, I think, um, you know, I, I just wanted to highlight the point. It's not always this massive billion dollar hacks that happen. A lot of times it's, you know, stuff you don't hear about um, because, you know, as an attacker, you, you know, it, you don't want your bread and butter to be all gone in, you know, one one fell swoop, right? You, you know, you want to extract as much as you can over time without being detected. Um, so there's, uh, you know, it's just something for, for people to, to you know keep an eye on um you know that you know one of the issues with the centralized exchange services is that you know it's a fundamental problem it's not just oh they coded something wrong it's like you know how, how the process of doing things has issues to it that you know people should be aware of yeah that's very insightful so it sounds like there are many minefields out there which, which i guess increases the stress level of of any user and we are here to try to convince them to, to withdraw the wallets and take custody over them. So let's go back in and try to summarize, like, what does this process look like for, for, for the average user? Which by, by this point, they are, they are having the coins in a central exchange. So what do they need to do to take custody over them and avoid all these minefields and stay secure? And before, Karan, you had mentioned the hardware wallets as the key. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. And that's like always my like first recommendation. Get like a proper, you know, like hardware wallet set up. I mean, that's worth it. You need to do research, get a safe, secure one. And, you know, like also diversify, you know, like backups and, you know, like setups, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's a substantial amount, you know, if it's say, you know, something like more than a thousand dollars and stuff like, I mean, I would distribute that, you know, like you just need to start thinking about second hardware wallet, a second like backup, maybe something that's purely off, you know, line, something that's non-digital, something that's analog, right? Like there's all these like steel backup possibilities and so on. But yeah, I mean, j just aim for like a truly trustless setup. You'd always need to consider one thing, like, what if like the device or whatever like i'm using you know for my crypto operations is infiltrated right like that's always and and assume that you are infiltrated that your smartphone your laptops your all these like like mainstream end user devices how i call them 100 percent infiltratable all of them at any point of time there's a zero day exploit that allow full takeover of a device that's one thing we all need to keep in mind and sometimes the price for such a a zero day exploit or just the vulnerability of it is like cheap right like in regards like to the potential like attack so yeah i mean hardware wallet really that's always always I, the, the, the first thing you should do before you even buy crypto before you buy crypto buy yourself a proper like you know setup i mean technically you take an old laptop that's still robust solid remove the network interface card remove like bluetooth and anything that exposes it to you know like a uh, like a wireless you know communication and you could use that as as a hardware wallet right like i mean that's what the hardware wallet at the end of the day kind of is it's isolated from you know like external access but in this case bit more solid than if you'd use like an, an offline computer as you would have to have a solid setup right like cryptographic backup you know like a protection included etc cetera, etc cetera. but yeah, anyway I'm, I'm sure the others also like have some stuff to add here well i will quickly ask what is your go-to hardware wallet it, it's trezor uh, right like my go-to hardware wallet is trezor because of the mainly open source like hardware design open source like firmware 
you know, like everything is, you know, like uh, very transparent around the device, past vulnerabilities, etc. The way they've handled it was like very good, very well executed. Um, I believe they're a very, very um, good provider for hardware wallets. And I prefer them over other, you know, like popular wallets. That's great. Yeah, I think I think what Kadan said uh, touches most, if not all of the points to consider uh, moving, you know, funds off of a centralized exchange and then doing self-custody. And the only thing I would add is if you're uncomfortable with it, then just test it, you know, try... Um, creating the hardware wallet, write your seed, write the backup, delete it, try to restore it. Uh, and that way, you know, you you get comfortable with it. You start small and then you start building trust. Um, and, you know, and then when, when you're comfortable with it, then you can start moving your funds off of the centralized exchanges and, and self-custody them. These are very helpful points. So let's say someone is just getting started and they're not ready to invest in, in Trezor or, or whatever reason that just seems too complicated. But most of us have some sort of old computer laying around. So what type of steps would they take if you want to transform this into a, into a, like an offline uh, wallet? Um, like what wallet could they install and, and use? For, I guess it depends on the coin, right? It depends on the... On the coin that the user wants to to store, um, I mean, if it's a Bitcoin wallet, they have multiple options to install on a on a device. So I guess you'd start there. But um, I don't know if Kadan agrees. I, I suppose every coin has like an official wallet, like a, like a native wallet. So depending on that, you would uh, install that on on a device. And, yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, that would be about my kind of like procedure. If it's about really setting up your own kind of like, you know, like offline environment and stuff, I'd go with the official implementation for the, you know, like specific coins. If it's about, you know, if I have my hardware wallet, okay, and I've done the setup and everything, and I think about, okay, wh which software wallet do I use to control this hardware wallet? There's, there's different, you know, options. You can use the official ones. You can use like third-party wallets, right? Like, I mean... Example in the Ethereum world, MetaMask seems to be a very like popular wallet that users you know use with their hardware wallets, with their hot wallets, with just like everything. Um, is, oh, there's also you know like uh, that's something like we're also like you know Komodo wallet. I guess like would be like a potential you know like candidate you know like upon reaching like better stability and and full hardware wallet support. If, as for, as of now, it it mainly covers you know like regular like wallet operations. But we're like about, you know, like to expand this, like, you know, like to swaps and, you know, like the the, the way, you know, like the, the, the wider, like key management, you know, like, you know, like uh, happen specifically, like, for example, the, the HD wallet scope, right? Like, so I guess it's also a lot about like, you know, the attention of a user, the re user requirements, right? While some users might really just want like a very simple, you know, like setup, some might want like more complex ones with DeFi access, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I, I agree like to what was said before, like best way is just, you know, inform yourself, engage with, you know, hardware wallets, test different ones if you think, you know, that's that's what you want to do, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Jason, do you have any tips from your side for newcomers who are just entering the crypto? Uh, yeah, it, I mean, I would get a uh, secondary uh, device, um, you know, if you're gonna, you know, hold uh, backups. Uh, something with biometric, uh, you know, encrypt, you know, biometrically locked, uh, you know, so that in case somehow that device does fall into the the wrong hands, it's not easy for them to to get into, not impossible. Uh, yeah, it. Yeah, I guess that's about what it, what I have to, to add. Also, you know, splitting up, uh, you know, the the seed itself, uh, or you know, using. Uh, you know, fake or obfuscated seeds. Like, um, you can have a seed that, um, you know, that say has one word that's off, and if an attacker somehow gets the seed, uh, either it doesn't have any coins in it, or you put coins in that fake seed, just uh, you know, but you don't put all your money in in that fake seed. But it just, you know, in case somehow you get extorted out of it, uh, you can give something and be like, hey, oh, that's all I have, and yeah uh, yeah most people 
you know, it, but at the same time, you can still use that same base, you know, phrase to, to you know, to access your, your full coins, but you also have a way of, you know, uh, throwing thieves off the, off the trail if you find yourself in a tough situation. And that is an interesting tip. I haven't thought of that before. Well, we have had uh, tons of good input here, advice, so to so kind of summarize, so everyone should get uh, hardware wallets, for example, Trezor, and then play around with crypto, get comfortable. If you have old devices laying around, turn those into your um, go to crypto like computer, for example, and just diversify your funds across multiple wallets and even a few hardware wallets if, if, if you have a lot of crypto. And, and then just, yeah, play around to get, get comfortable with the wallets. And, and we, we have in Komodo, we have developed a Komodo wallet. So let's talk a little bit about that. So what kind of a solution would this be for a, for a newcomer? Why, why should they check out Komodo wallet? Yeah, I think the Komodo wallet sort of um, encompasses some of the best things out of many, many types of wallets. It's all in one, in, in essence. So for a user uh, that is looking for maybe a wallet for their desktop, a wallet for their mobile, uh, or even just something they can use on the browser, they can lean on, on the Komodo wallet for that. And um, besides being a way to store your coins, you can also use it to trade. You can use it uh, to buy cryptocurrencies and some of the upcoming uh, updates. We're going to be enabling the option for people to be able to buy their coins there. So if you're a newcomer, you can use the Komodo wallet to enter crypto and really start you know, using it, start playing around with it. And if you're one of the, you know, the people that have been around for a while and might have um, more experience, then you can play around with more advanced features like decentralized trading. So I think it, it fits the bill for a lot of, uh, a lot of people, d depending on where you are no? and, and on, your, on your crypto uh, travels. Yeah, that's a great point that Commodore Wallet could be the entry point so that no longer do you need to sign up for a centralized exchange, but you could already be using a non-custodial wallet and, and you're able to get and buy crypto. So, so how does that happen, Charles? What, what is the future, uh, future upcoming feature, the Fiat on wrap? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that the team has been working on is allowing or implementing the option for people to purchase uh, Bitcoin directly with their credit card. Um, or with some other type of payment option like Apple Pay, Google Pay. And um, in the, I think Kadan can tell us more or less when we should expect this to be released, but uh, we're, we, we'll have multiple options for people to be able to buy and sell crypto from the uh, Komodo wallet. Yeah, so I'll, so I'll add just like a, a bit on, on this. I mean, we, we've initially like targeted like the fiat, you know, like on, on ramp like solution, which basically allows you like to use your fiat crypto however we're also looking you know to expand this besides multiple you know like providers to also like a wider like functionality scope with a potential off-ramp feature we're looking at the rollout like initial rollout like during like beta test for the end of this month um but yeah we'll do like a dedicated announcement around like this uh, feature and and we're also like you know um planning some uh, campaigns around it that's awesome and I like the way you also just put it that Komodo is like the, the all-in-one wallet. So, so it has a little bit of everything and, and um, it's turning the real powerful tool for any newcomer to kind of get, get involved and, and try a few things, use the latest blockchain technology, including the, the Atomic Swap exchange. Um, the, the last aspect I would like to touch on, on this conversation that we haven't really talked about yet is the the seed phases and, and backing them up. Because no matter what, no matter what uh, solution you use, like hardware wallet or, or a Komodo wallet or any other non-custodial wallet, you do get the seed phase and, and you need to back that up. And a lot of people make the mistake of just saving that in their computer, just in a text file. And that is the worst thing you can do. So don't do that. <laughs> but but uh, any tips, like easy ways to secure the seed phase. So I guess I, I guess just write it to a paper and put put to a safe place, or or maybe even split the into few places. Or or any do you do you guys have any final tips for how to secure the, the backup of the seed phase? 
I mean, I really recommend like distributed setups, you know, like uh, so-called like Shamir backups and Shamir face backups. And, you know, it, it's basically, it's like multi-signature, like key setups where you, you know, where your keys are split and you can like, you know, geographically distribute them, you know, and create a more optimal setup, right? Like, so, I mean, if, if you go super crazy, you can like spread it across different countries, right? Like with different people. That they're close to you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, even like places no one knows about, right? Like so, I guess there's quite exotic potential like setups, but it really depends, like yeah, on the use case. I guess the 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 amount that's to be secured, right? Like and it it probably goes like from using these like steel metal based backups, right? Like uh, I don't know, you know, maybe even like incorporated into the concrete of the walls of your house up to i guess probably like nfc chips you know implanted like under your skin and secured with some additional passphrase and then again like you could have like multiple passphrase for multiple data sets like 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 the idea of a poly of like a fake backup seat so there's so many like you know like probably like, like potential ways of like doing a somehow safe secure setup uh, i mean most importantly i wouldn't you know store it in obvious places not at your place, right? Like uh, not in a safe, in a treasure, uh, you know, not like within notebooks and not within like books and all these things, right? Like, and you know, anything that someone's seen in a Hollywood movie, etc. I guess that's where the bad guys will like first look for something, you know, like, um, so yeah, just be creative, you know, like, and, 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 um, yeah, yeah, that's that's all I can add like so far, right? Like I guess I won't disclose the way I've done it, but to all the bad guys out there, you'll have like a hard time, right? Like so, even if I get kidnapped, I mean I'll have to pay with my life. I'm sorry, right? Because <laughs> I'll not be able like to access you know any funds, and that's like I guess the best way of securing it. Because the real bad guys, you know, they will observe you, they will look at you, and if they see you, okay. You know that becomes like complex that's not worth you know like the hustle that's i guess like the best way to secure yourself i think by this point uh, the people listening should have a pretty good understanding on what to do so just try a wallet back up the seat think of a clever place to put it or distribute it in multiple places and and then you can rest at peace and play with the crypto technology like it was to mint and, and then just wait for the new innovations to roll in and, and it's going to be just coming easier and easier as time goes on. We are now entering the, the final segment of, of this uh, or the ending basically. Do you guys have any final words or um, conclusions? What would you like to share with the, with the audience and the newcomers? Yeah, I think um, it's important for everybody to know that there's a lot of information available to them if they're starting to learn how to use these technologies, how to create the wallets, how to transact. And it's just a matter of, you know, doing a little bit of research and finding the right the right piece of information and then testing it out. At the end of the day, that, that really, it's what it comes down to is just trying it out. And I've recently met uh, people in in conferences that are 60 years old and they, they, they're scared, they get scared because they don't know how to back up wallets, but they, they do it and they've learned quite a bit just trying it out. So it doesn't matter your age, it doesn't matter like where you are in the path, um, just reach out if you, for example, the Komodo community, um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask and somebody's gonna help you. So there's a lot of information there. Don't make the mistake to think that the information, you have to pay for it or that it's guarded. It's, it's all out there. It's just a matter of finding it. I think that would be my my last uh, comment on it. Yeah, I mean, there's this saying, right? Don't don't put all eggs in one basket, right? That's also one thing, I guess, to keep in mind, like with crypto and, and just overall in, in general, diversify everything, right? Like the, the that starts like with the asset and risk management and goes down like to your, you know, like uh, backups and the way you you you're setting them up. Even these can be, you know, like distributed and diversified. And and yeah, just stay safe. I guess right. Like whenever like you think about it, and you really take the time to think about it, you'll you'll actually figure right. Like what's what's the best way, you know, like and how to to handle it. So if this also means at the same, you know, time. Don't do you know these key setups when you're drunk or when you're like stressed or when you're like in a bad mood you know like have a clear mind you know like it's, it's probably something like you know to do with a clean nice focus 
arrested, calm mind, etc., etc. But it it really boils down to just you know com common sense strategy and, and you know it's what's best for you and your sets. Yeah, um, I would like to add uh, you know as much as you know we we want people to go to self custody and that definitely is the way to go forward. Uh, you know, it should you know in, in their current uh, situations uh, if they're using an exchange or or some other service uh, hold their coins. Um, just you know use some general best practices with that um you know if, if you're in crypto or you know uh, you're you should uh, how should i say I, I would say stay away from uh your browser extensions uh, you know especially if you don't have any way of actually determining what is going on behind the scenes with that extension um also you know when you or accessing, you know, your, the exchange of your crypto on, um, you know, don't have any other tabs open, um, you know, do routine, uh, you know, virus checks, always keep your, your, uh, you know, AV and your firewalls up to date, um, you know, your firmware on your router, uh, you know, basically just general computer security stuff, um, you know, that, you know, it, um, when you're holding your own funds and, uh, you know, or, or even using custodial service, uh, you know, I guess crypto makes it that you have a lot more responsibility, you know, on, on your end. So, uh, you know, you, you know, uh, just something, some uh, tips to be aware of uh, when uh, using your crypto um, to, yeah, make sure you're safe. If anyone has any questions, then uh, feel free to join the Komodo community on Komodo Discord. Just ask there and uh, you will find people who are there to help you on your journey in crypto. And also we are trying to put together a lot of uh, educational materials. So any type of feedback or questions to us really help us to develop these resources. So feel free to also reach out to me, Audo, with any anything like that that you have in mind. And let's together create uh, the resources that that going to get people to get started with, with crypto. So with that, big thank to you guys for joining. And I will see you around in a future episode. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Voices of Komodo. We welcome your ideas for future episodes. You can drop by our Discord and say hello. Remember, sign up for updates and get our starter resource at komodoplatform.com slash guide. Enjoy the rest of your morning or evening, wherever you might be.